Tenakurika Tauri One. We're back for the for the seventh and final instalment of our legal lowdown on the lockdown. We're joined today, Nessa, Dean, Eddie, and I, with two of our colleagues who have appeared on previous lockdowns, Dr. Dr. Joel Colin Rios and Dr. Petra Butler, both professors at the law school. Um, who are, we're going to talk about our reflections in general about the legal situation over the last couple of months. But rather than just having a general discussion, we decided that what we would do is to focus on three questions um, as a kick or, as a way of kicking off discussion. So the first question is going to be what, if for each of us, was the most striking feature of the legal situation around the lock, lockdown? What then? What was the most surprising thing? And then we're going to perhaps at the very end just reflect on what lessons we might draw from all of this in the future. But guests should go first. So I'm going to invite our colleague Joel Conan Rios to start off with the first question. So what, Joel, for you was the most striking feature of the last couple of months in terms of the lockdown? Joel. Thanks very much, Jeff. For me, one of the most striking things, which is probably only a striking thing for a constitutional theorist, is how hard it was to, to answer what, would, what should be perhaps a very simple question. And the question is, has the constitution broadly understood changed? That is to say, are the relations between citizens and the state different now from what they were before the pandemic? I think the answer is probably that it is too soon to know. Um, in the context of an unwritten constitution, constitutional change is sometimes only identifiable in hindsight, not while it is actually taking place. For example, um, the idea of government ordering everyone to stay home and to only go out to find food or exercise or to go to the hospital, and of people accepting this as a legitimate exercise of the coercive power of the state, I think it was something unthinkable um, in the past, but it was generally accepted during the emergency. But then the question becomes, will that level of acceptance of high levels of state inter intervention in, in, in our daily lives become normal? So for example, imagine that um, as an environmental protection measure, a government in New Zealand or overseas decides to order a three-day level four lockdown every fortnight just to protect the, the environment. Now, that may actually be a good idea for the future of the planet, or perhaps, I don't know. Uh, but if a government anywhere in the world tried something like that, say, in 2018, I imagine it would have, it, it would have probably been a scandal and would have probably resulted in different kinds of protests and, and resistance. But, but what, what if it is tried next year, in 2021? Would the level of acceptance or opposition be the same? If not, perhaps something fundamental would have changed in that jurisdiction about the relationship between citizens and the state. And in some contexts, um, for example, in the case of environmental protection, that change may indeed be welcomed by many, but it may become highly problematic in, in other contexts. So I think that that's what I would like to say about that point. And, and I would like to, to handle um, now the question to, to Petra. who I think is muted. For a human rights lawyer to make it short, and we had this in a previous uh, lockdown discussion, is the lack of public discussion on those lockdown measures and the lack of challenges regarding the lockdown measures. So I would li have liked to say, I uh, was kind of astonished, the lack of wanting to protest against the, our rights, our restrictions of the rights of freedom of movement uh, and some of those measures. So it's basically what Joel said from the human rights point of view, has that now meant for us that we are so compliant that we are not challenging the government anymore using our human rights framework to do this. And with that, I hand over to Dean. Yeah, I, th I think um, for me, it's, it's not really about rules, even though we've spent kind of the last seven weeks uh, uh, talking about rules, it's about the power of people and the power of persuasion. Because I think what we've seen over the last seven weeks is leadership, council to do the right thing, team of five millions, that legitimacy of state actions has been conditioned by 
It's a regular matter of fact explanation in the classic terms, that rendering of account and the, the due interrogation. So for me, I, I don't think it's, it, 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 it's um, compliance per se. It's been stuff that has been uh, built up through, through leadership, through people. And we can see and reflect, I think, on, on, on the relative merits of those that have been governing and their ability to carry uh, the people with them. You know, Adern and Robertson were on the stage doing the hefting. It's no surprise that Clark fell into the background because he wasn't able to, to, to carry the people with him. Um, Bloomfield was fantastic, but what happened to um, Ombla? The, the whole of government controller, who we only saw in those first, early days. You can think about Costa versus Bush in terms of, you know, the, the, the exercise of, 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 of police power. And also in terms of when we're talking about those that are governing, I, I don't think we can forget the faceless bureaucrats who I think have, we've seen speak through those, um, those cabinet papers. They've been working away, but you get that sense of the industry of a civil service doing their best to uh, protect the um, the being of the people. And I think uh, you're picking up on and, 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 and pivoting back to some of our earlier conversations. Um, we know that there's been this delicate tango between the um, political branch and the bureaucratic branch, because it's not just been about what the rules are, but about who makes them, who animates them. And, and I think rightly we've seen... Um, workarounds to make sure that the old-fashioned legislation is adequate for current uh, crisis to ensure that the people who are closest to the citizens are those responsible for shaping um, and Im implementing the rules and that I think has really helped in terms of that um, that high level of compliance. I guess in terms of people just briefly we might come back to this in this discussion I think the, vo the voice and face that's probably been, been missing in this pandemic is that of Māori, of iwi and hapu and 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 where that partnership has been in in, in relation to the response but with that i'll pass over to nessa thanks dean um so i reflected a huge amount on um compliance and and a lot from my own perspective i've, I've gone through that day that monday where uh you know we were all listening to the press conference and then you know as as, as other colleagues have said already we all packed up and went home apparently without protest um, and I just think it's absolutely fascinating that idea that we are, however uh, schooled in human rights and constitutional law we are, humans are quite naturally compliant. Um, but I've also been reflecting on whether a health threat is different to other types of threats. Um, so for instance, if it had been a security threat or a terrorism threat, would we have reacted differently? Um, because I think we've got an even heavier conditioning um, against contracting disease. Um, so that's another interesting aspect. I thought as well it was interesting in New Zealand that we were so compliant even though we didn't have what's described as the reality constraint. We weren't seeing people with COVID-19. Um, very few of us know somebody in New Zealand who's had the virus, fewer still somebody who's been really affected or has died and yet we were still very very willing to comply. Um, and I know early on that the Prime Minister noted that she had been very influenced by a report from a friend in the UK. So it's interesting how we were still willing to comply, even though we didn't have the realities of the situation here. Um, so, so it certainly challenged some of even my own, what I thought I, I knew myself about compliance and my own personal views. Um, so I think handing over to Eddie now. Thanks, Nessa. Uh, there's sort of a couple of things I was I was tossing up talking about here. Um, one of them's the astonishingly good response in terms of our public service in reacting very quickly to a completely unexpected event. Um, and maybe we can talk about that later in discussion. But what I've talked about essentially every week is how remarkably well, um, and perhaps slightly different view on this than Petra, our accountability mechanisms have worked. No, that isn't through the courts so much, although we did have a few court challenges. One is ongoing uh, and one was successful. Um, the Christensen Judicial Review was successful. Um, but if we look beyond the courts, our other accountability mechanisms have just in the middle of an astonishing crisis functioned very well. We have the Auditor General looking at PPE distribution. Um, we have a really creative solution with uh, the Epidemic Response Committee, 
um, which I see wrapped up today, sort of bookending our sessions. It's essential. The lifetime of this podcast has been the lifetime of the ERC. Um, those external mechanisms have been functioning, but also internal ones. Um, departmental reviews, you'll remember the Aisha Vero report, uh, again on, on contact tracing, that was done internally in the ministry, but made available to us. We saw it, and it wasn't particularly flattering. And generally good functioning of our media reporting all of this. Um, daily press conferences with them dutifully sitting socially distanced in the Beehive Theatreette. Um, in transparency more generally, we saw that huge dump of documents all the way up to cabinet level. Um, other than the timing, which was slightly cynical, other countries just don't get that information, that cabinet level decision making that gives us a really clear picture of how all of this happened. Some problems, I think, at a lower level, um, DHBs and local councils had been stonewally and, and did not have, I think, the resources or the skills to communicate as they should have, and that shouldn't be discounted. But by and large, I think the accountability story is a good news one, and strikingly so. And with that, I will pass over to Jeff. So, so far in these podcasts, I've tried just to be the gentle coordinator of other people's good thoughts. And partly that's because I still haven't really made my mind up about what's happened over the last couple of months. Like Joel, I would wait for five years or 10 years or maybe 50 years before I said what was really striking about what happened. But at the moment, I get back to an idea that I have about what makes New Zealand constitutionalism different. And I think that's what's so striking about what's happened now, that we saw other jurisdictions which we normally associate ourselves with adopt quite different legal kinds of regimes many particularly rule-based, where we didn't. We adopted a just-in-time, very ambiguous set of basic understandings about how a society should survive in a, in a crisis like this. And we often think about the rule of law as requiring clear rules. There's a very famous book written by an English judge, Tom Bingham, which really titled the rule of law, but really says that Essentially, what you really just need is clear rules and people should have to follow them. But actually, what we saw in the last couple of months is that clear rules aren't necessarily so important. And that's what's really struck me, that actually we weren't that worried about what the rules said, as Dean's perhaps hinted at. But what we were worried about was the principles that lie behind the rules. And I think that one of the, this, perhaps one of the two striking things for me is that ambiguity worked in New Zealand. The other striking thing, and perhaps this is my surprising thing, is that this just-in-time model actually worked. So I have this theory of the way New Zealand actually functions. New Zealanders can be very poor at long-term planning. We all know that some of that infrastructure is not great because we aren't great about thinking in the five-year or 10-year or 20-year envelope. But my sense of the way New Zealand government best works is that just-in-time model, and I use the example of turning up to casualty, as probably everybody who's watching this has done, and you can sit in a casualty waiting room for hours, nothing happens, and you get very disconsolate about the New Zealand public health system. But then you see somebody arrive with a heart attack, or I remember my own father turning up with a heart condition, and literally people arrive from everywhere to help out, to make sure that the just-in-time model of healthcare there worked. And that's my sense of what's happened here, is that probably we weren't as well prepared as we should have been for this event. Statutes are not really good enough. Our model of disaster legislation is not good enough, and we need to do better with all of that stuff. And that's all true, and that's something which some of us will be interested in the next couple of years to, to unpick. But I expect my big thing is the just-in-time model just worked. And that may be true, and we go through, we worked in the science area, and it seems to have worked in the, in the law area. And I suppose 
that's both my most striking thing and also my most surprising thing because the constitutional lawyer, I think lots of people in other countries would be very surprised that a country can work like that. And the other thing I just say about the rule of law concerns, which I shared and I think in stage four and level four were particularly pronounced when we didn't know what the rules were. I think one of the things we need to do before we condemn what happened in New Zealand is to actually figure out whether what was actually done on the ground was any worse than any other country. Because it's my impression that although the, word, the rules are ambiguous, unclear, and the police probably couldn't enforce all the things that the Prime Minister was saying that they could enforce, in fact, they often didn't. And in fact, they knew very well what they could enforce and what they might not enforce. So my supposition of the whole thing is that maybe ambiguity is not something which is the enemy of the rule of law, but in a society like New Zealand, it might actually be its friend. And that's, I think, something we need to take very seriously in New Zealand, not always say that we need to judge ourselves against the legality standards of a larger society, and that perhaps we do things mostly okay when we need to. But I think Petra is going to come back now with her most surprising thing about um, the last seven or eight weeks from a different perspective. I'll mute myself first. Um, yeah, while you, were, while you were talking, I was thinking about it. And I think um, here for me, also what shines through as a completely different, uh, as completely different, definitely a different model of government and what government is uh, for me. And you can shed your upbringing, I think, there. So um, I think no government was prepared and every government had to do things like, you know, the good number at wire New Zealand approach and do things, you know, on the fly. But uh, for me, what, what was surprising was I thought how wary the government was um, of scrutiny while it was happening. Now, of course, we have the document dump, if we want to call it this way, which I think is great. I'm not sure that New Zealand is the only government uh, that has done that, that those uh, uh, documents aren't available in other governments as well. But we have not heard from other ministers. It was like a, basically a very limited show of the Prime Minister, Grant Robertson, Ashley Bloomfield, maybe Winston Peters. And the question is why? And I mean, this is something we might find out, but I, I thought that came across as the government being incredibly controlling over the information we got. We didn't hear a lot from other um, government officials other than Ashley Bloomfield for my, for my likings. So for me, that was a little, that was a little bit uh, surprising for me that it didn't seem to be that open government where, you know, every minister has, could talk, every minister or, you know, could be interviewed by the, by the sounds of it. Um, yeah, so I hand over to Eddie, who probably has a contrary <laughs> view to me. I mean, I, I don't disagree with, with a lot of the factual observations. I mean, it's just, that is what happened. This was fronted by Grant Robertson and, and um, Jacinda Ardern and Ashley Bloomfield, who is not a minister. You might think after his... Um, mountain biking escapades that uh, he took over from David Clark as, as Minister of Health. But we do have a health minister. And as Petra said, it's, uh, he, he was remarkably absent from the public eye. And it, it, it's right to ask why. Uh, but for the reasons that I think I mentioned on, on what I found most striking, I do think in general, the accountability and transparency picture uh, was good. Um, but what I found most surprising, and this sort of builds off um, what Nessa and Dean and Jeff were saying is uh, I think the reason that our communication based vague um, reliance on principles rather than rules worked is a, a culture of compliance I didn't entirely know existed in New Zealand that we all just did what the government said we trust them uh, polling has shown that the general mood of the country reflected that we thought that this was the right thing to do and there are grumbles on implementation, but outright dissent for the actions taken as a whole was a tiny minority, um, if probably over-reported in the media. Um, you might have thought that it was bigger than, than it was, but 
polling suggests it's something like 6%. I mean, it, astonishing conformity with what had happened. And in one sense, this is a good thing. We got through COVID um, when we knew there were gaps in the law. We knew that things were just in time and scrambling. Um, but looking forward, is it a wholly good thing? Um, it's right to be skeptical of new government intrusions into our lives and our homes. And it's a bit worrying that some New Zealanders uh, rushed to the snitch lines and literally crashed the police web form for curtain twitching and, and dobbing in your neighbours. Um, that worried me a little bit. It, uh, on, that's, and th that is the flip side of the good bit the, that let us in solidarity um, act as a team of five million. But then there's that sort of conformist line that showed up slightly unexpectedly. And this might just be who we are as a nation. Um, but if that's the case, we need to reflect on what it means, good and bad, for um, how we deal with similar situations in the future. Uh, and with that, I will hand over to Dean. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm picking up on the uh, point that Jeff's made about the surprising lack of law, the fact that law was left in the in the shadows in this whole debate and, and and we've talked about the other things which have been prominent but i just i wonder if this point it's useful to sort of say i think we've got to connect the dots and and and, and say there are multiple layers in play here there was those nudges the urging the guidance there was discretion that and uh, um judgment that was being made by the people on the ground and there was law and 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 as was pointed out it was very law light you i mean i think we forget that it wasn't until 48 hours into the lockdown that we actually knew there were rules uh, you know, as in there was a, 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 a health act order. Um, we knew there were some statutory rules and some um, enforcement discretion, but we didn't know how our, 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 our command from, from the prime minister to stay at home was actually going to be implemented. And, and I, guess, I guess one of the things is that all those things, the, the effectiveness, the efficacy of those things all depend on each other. Um, to maintain that social license for us to have liberty um, restricted, and um, I mean, I think we saw some of the challenges when uh, um, um, when the actions of ministers were undermining that social license. So too, that question of the legality of the Health Act, that that if that had been um, front-footed and, and and sort of exploded in the first week of uh, lockdown perhaps we might have had a different reaction because yes, doing the right thing is important, but if there is a sort of a black hole of the rule of law, which erodes and, 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 and um, corrodes that um, uh, social license, then we're in a different problem. And I think too, that, 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 that uh, gap between law and guidance has always been a worrying one for us because again, it goes to the legit le legitimacy. We can forgive a little bit of a gap and understanding that, you know, like the government tells us to eat, you know, live fruit and veg a day. Sometimes they just tell us to do the right thing, even though it might be legally enforceable. But there's a time at which that congruence between the law and the guidance and the nudges needs to be, um, well, greater care needs to be uh, taken with that. So um, surprising th thing for me really has been that idea of the um, law left in the shadows. But I'll pass over to Nessa for her thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Dean. That was something that I uh, struggled with my personal reaction to, again, going back to that Monday where we all packed up and went home. Um, that, yeah, at that time, as a criminal lawyer, I did not know the order under which I was being told to do that. And I think, you know, we very quickly scrambled in our faculty group chat to work it out. But I was quite surprised that I was very willing to to, to comply with that. And I think that point about social license has really been resonating with me as somebody who, who researched as a state surveillance. We've seen social license change very rapidly in the past. I mean, 9-11 would be another big one, but just how quickly our, our, um, our willingness to comply and our um, com level of comfort with privacy and liberty restrictions will change. Um, and another thing that's resonated with me is I suppose how little some people in New Zealand appear to know about police powers and how much other people know. And I think that really demonstrates um, how some communities have so much more contact with the police and other communities just don't have to worry about it. Um, and this is something that I see quite a lot in, in lectures when I um, lecture about jury trials or um, police questioning powers that, 
um, as somebody who grew up in, in the 1980s in Ireland, it's, it's deeply embedded in me that um, we need restrictions on police power because of wrongful convictions and um, emergency powers. But I find a lot of our students just don't worry about it because it's something that is never going to affect them and they've never had to think about it. But you will often get certain students coming up after the lecture to say, um, you know, I don't agree with what the rest of the class were saying, and they will often come for from these over police communities. So perhaps in some ways it will, um, this idea of, you know, everybody being stopped by the police and roadblocks and um, yeah, the snitch line might make people hopefully think a little bit more about um, the effect of, of police power. So that might be a positive, but yet the very extensive social license um, that has occurred over the past weeks, I do find a bit concerning as well. Um, so I think I'm passing back to Joel now. Thanks um, very much, um, Nessa. So as, as Nessa was saying, um, something that I think has surprised everyone has been the ability of the state and, and society to make quick and major changes in the way we live in order to deal with the pandemic. Uh, one can see those changes, I think, as having implicitly been guided by a very old and sometimes controversial notion associated with, with Rousseau, which is the idea that government should be solely guided by the need to ensure ensure the well-being of everyone, as opposed to, for example, being influenced by how one policy may affect a particularly important economic interest or by the fear of offending the views or of this or that politically influential group. Now, this may sound as a platitude at this point, but I think it is important because, of course, the pandemic is not the only major social problem we have or the only things that causes sickness or death. And we and when I say we, I just don't mean New Zealand, but human societies in general have all sorts of problems related, for example, to poverty in some problem, in some countries, extreme poverty and hunger, um, lack of appropriate uh, housing, um, different forms of social mar marginalization and so on. Now, no, those problems have been with us for years or centuries, but they have rarely or never resulted in the kind of response we have seen during the pandemic. And the question I think is, is why is that? Uh, I mean, those problems result in perhaps more suffering and deaths than COVID-19, perhaps even by COVID-19 without any sort of lockdown. So one difference may be that poverty and social marginalization and so on do not seem as dangerous as COVID-19 because they falsely appear to us or to people in power or in positions of, positions of privilege as less arbitrary. So they, they do not seem to present an urgent threat to us or to our families or to our friends. There are things that only affect other people for sort of reasons that are not, not possible for us to change. But of course, in the large scheme of things, those other social problems like poverty or lack of adequate housing are, are as arbitrary as, as a COVID-19 infection. And perhaps if they are dealt with the, with the same kind of urgency and energy that is now being seen during the pandemic, the world, in fact, could be a very different um, place. Um, so with that, I think I'll just pass it back to, to Jeff, um, who will um, then lead us to the last part of the, of the discussion. So the last part is lessons for the future, which is, I find the hardest, always the hardest question to answer. Like, there are some basic questions that need to be resolved, like we need a proper disaster law in New Zealand. We need a proper public health legislation system. We need some questions answered by politicians as to why there was no public health bill a decade ago, or no public health act a decade ago. But those are about COVID-19. And I think the lesson I've taken from the future is the just-in-time worked. And it works in New Zealand because I think of some of the things that Nessa has talked about, that in many ways we have an image of New Zealand as being a relatively homogeneous society where society protects the individual freedoms of the people who are part of it. And certainly I've always felt that about New Zealand, that I am free not because of the law, but because of the social conventions around how we treat other people. Now my lesson is that that almost didn't work in this case because for whatever reason, we forgot at the very point we were trying to save ourselves, we forgot who in fact we were. And I was as guilty as everybody else. 
because who we actually are is not a homogeneous society. In particular, I have spent a lot of the last 10 years, and I know other members of this panel and other members of the university and other members of our society have talked constantly about the need for Maori consultation and involvement. But we forgot about that. I forgot about it for at least a couple of weeks until someone pointed it out kind of politely to me. And that person was 100% right. And what I have always called the Lambton Key Constitution, because I think this represents a homogeneous view of how New Zealand can be conveniently governed in a way that maximizes the freedom of almost all of us, has always had at its floor the people who don't walk down Lambton Key, who aren't part of the cafe society, who don't discuss what the law is, who aren't part of that lawmaking elite of which I, and I think just about everybody who's in this call, are part of. And that's the lesson for me from all of this in the end, is that when we're trying to save ourselves, we can't forget as quickly as we forgot who we actually are. And so, for example, one of the things that I thought was a really good suggestion about the um, bill, you know, there's a lot of hysteria, frankly, about the health response bill that went through Parliament a couple of weeks ago. As Nessa hinted, one of the really disappointing aspects of that was that the police powers in that bill are standard police powers, not pretty much standard police powers. And in fact, they're better than standard police powers because there are protections that are built into the Act that are not existing in other pieces of legislation. But one of the things that's definitely lacking from that is a Treaty of Waitangi clause. Like when you look at it, it's just stunning when you think about it, that we didn't even bother when we we're passing that bill to require the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi to be honored in the exercise of those powers. And I think that also goes to other communities who are not really part of the discussion. And I think that's what we really need to be careful of in the future, because as we go forward, Quite rightly, we're not home, we know we're not hom homogeneous. And as Nessa said, it's just not Nessa's experience, it's my experience too, that my Maori and minority students often come up to me and say, your experience of the legal system is not my experience. They will tell you that they have been the subject of what are really unreasonable searches by particular police people. And we need to take that seriously. And I think we worked now, I think maybe, this just-in-time model worked, but I don't know whether it will work in the future. And we need a society to take seriously those other dimensions that are really important to who we are. Um, and that maybe my love of ambiguity only really works where people have a, common a sufficient common understanding about what's supposed to be achieved. And I'm not sure that's necessarily true in a, a New Zealand that's becoming increasingly different. So Nessa, who's gonna back me up completely, I hope. <laughs> Yeah, um, I suppose I've been been thinking a bit as well about that uh, focus on the collective or who who in fact the collective are, and and I think a lot of the discussion um, and this picks up on what Joel was 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 saying as well. Um, a lot of this really individual or sorry, really collective response while restraining individual rights in a sense can be quite positive. You know, we've had this idea we'll all wash our hands not to save ourselves but to save a vulnerable person in a rest home um, and a lot of those positive mes messages are fantastic but I'm quite worried about what may happen in in the near future and in the medium term with this idea and um, we've got a willingness apparently to significantly constrain the rights of individuals and um, for what objectively might be a very small risk. And um, so for instance, I think the 14 days in quarantine and the Christensen judicial review, and um, that risk was extremely low probably, but we were very, very willing to um, significantly constrain an individual's rights. And um, so I'm just a bit worried on how that will spill into other areas where we value individual liberties. So say, when we now think it's okay to take everybody's DNA and link it to your driving license on the very small risk um, that you might commit a crime at some stage um, might it very much support the incapacitation of people who are risky and um, people with serious psychiatric concerns and um, a, a lot of the people the serious offenders that come before the criminal courts um, would like 
uh, without parole be more acceptable to the public now? Because those are all instances where um, we restrain somebody's liberty on the basis of risk. Um, so, so that's quite a concern of mine. Um, I think the other very interesting one on this will be um, some of the medical funding decisions. So a lot of these Farm Act decisions are based on the idea that sorry, we cannot fund this uh, really fantastic um, cancer drug because it is just too expensive and it, the weighing up doesn't matter. And so I think these are some of these issues where the collective versus the individual, um, it will be interesting to see how those play out in other contexts. Um, so I think, uh, is it Eddie, are you next? Yeah, so uh, w the thought that I had is we really need to be aware of the two sides of our public service, um, the political side and, and the public servant side and, and the gap between the two. Our public servants, I think, have done a very good job in almost impossible circumstances. This just-in-time model that Jeff talks about ended up working, but it almost worked despite itself. Um, we didn't have modern public health legislation. There was a chance to pass it 10 years ago. Uh, wrangling and, and political pressure meant that it didn't get passed. We don't have a proper disaster statute. Um, we have a very lean public service, which is understaffed and underpaid by um, overseas comparators. We're not putting these people who do a good job for us in a position to do that job as well as they could. And I think that failure is on the political side. We saw fantastic political messaging during the crisis, but the preparation for it and lead up to it at a political level uh, was essentially a failure and, and we were lucky to get through it. These were choices by successive governments to run this in a particular way um, and as Nessa said, to prepare for this for the future, some more money is going to be need to be spent in some places which have been pretty much deliberately ignored for quite a while. Um, and I suspect these are issues that will come up at the inevitable Royal Commission of Inquiry that we will get at some starting at some point in the next 12 months. Uh, and I think uh, Dean is going to weigh in now. Yeah, and I, I underscore people's concerns with the development of, of frameworks and legislation and rules, but I just want to bring something else into play, which is I think that continuing need to uh, um, continue to invest in human capacity, expertise, memory, and things like values. And in that values clump, I, I, I include things like your know, deep concern for the of law and concern for your embedded understanding of, of rights and freedoms and so forth. Because um, frameworks, one thing, are important and they, they, they channel uh, conversations and thought, but actually people um, having that woven into their DNA is really important. And I think you know, reflecting back, well, we don't know, but we suspect that there have been many internal champions within government who have uh, been been banging the drum for the you know, rule of law, for rights and freedoms as well, and, and making uh, what could have been very blunt and very egregious legislation and rules look a lot better. And that really goes to that idea of you know, a different model of accountability. And I think some, a lesson for us is to be aware of what is that learning model, that encouraging continuous improvement through little food feedback loops, the ability to make mistakes, to recover, to improve, and so forth. You know, a great study is to track through the disaster legislation through the, the three earthquake um, bits of legislation and to look at the epidemic, um, uh, the public health one. On the back of that, there's an incredible sense of improvement, better the, the treatment of rights and things like that. Uh, rule of law is a bit sharper, more democratic and things like that. So you know, generation four of that is, is, is much better. But obviously, we also need to go to five, and there's, there have been some blind spots on things that we need to keep working on. Um, I guess can, just one last little lesson, and this is actually for our students, perhaps, and it's perhaps a cheeky one. Um, I think the lesson out of this and the lesson in the future is the importance 
of reading and understanding the story of statutes because tell you what I over the last three or four months I can count the number of cases I've read on on one hand um, and and that's you know Entech and Fitzgerald and Muldoon and Quake Outcast but I tell you what there is a pile of statutes on my office floor probably going to cause a bonfire may get shut down by the director general for being you know, insanitary and things like that but so much of the government action and, and the law in action here has been about words stories frameworks and, and and none of us knew had read this legislation before but over three months we had to get to know and understand it intimately and reflect on it and and and, and speak about it so for students you know you know, get the excitement, get the passion of reading a statute for the story um, uh, behind it. Now, I think I pass over to um, uh, Petra um, next. Yes, and I'm in it this time to, uh, to unmute myself immediately. Um, so I agree with everything everybody else has uh, said so far. I just want to take it, well, I will be continuing basically what I've said in regarding to the other two questions. Is, and for me, it is really the need to strengthen the courts and because I actually think the courts are a really important third pillar of government. They are there for the checks and so the questions are now there are two issues related to this. One is for me, do, is it actually fit to have a civil procedure for public law questions? Or do we need an administrative branch of government with its own rules? So I think that it's, it is really questionable to strike down or to not basically, well, strike down um, a claim that we had because the claimants used the wrong course of action rather than say, well, then, and then even saying, oh, there were some really interesting issues rather than having an administrative branch judicial branch which would say well you might have chosen the wrong course of action but actually the your claim you have might fit an x because when it comes to the challenge of public law questions this is not a contest who is right this is about finding the right answer for me um, and then and if you don't want that then the other issue we've got is that legal challenges are just too expensive and I actually did have a little bit of a look and in 2002 the law commission already said we need to do something because nobody can afford to challenge. This has been picked up by the IBA actually last year in a report which kind of comments on generally in common, common law countries legal challenges are too expensive. So either we look at this and leave the system as it is or we find some way of introducing an administrative judicial branch with different rules where it is not about for the government to play as you know the civil procedure game and put, pulling stops but rather where it is for the for the court to put be a real point of check um, in um, finding well the, the truth uh, would be nice for me coming from a civil law from a civil law jurisdiction um, and I think I have a lot of sympathy for the government, so I don't agree with my colleagues who say um, that Section 7 didn't, didn't give uh, the powers. I think in that situation, in a rights compliant uh, interpretation, I would have said, you know, the, the government needed to find, to make orders and do regulations that protected us all of us and nobody there was i think not no i think so far i've seen no government that had a disaster act or an epidemic act which was actually covering what they needed to cover and to quarantine an entire nation at one, all at once but after that i think it would have been nice that nearly every step of the government would have been open to challenge not because they did a bad job but i also think that we all own it and own this process and I think that was important to me and of course I can't deny where I'm coming from and the fact that there have been over 2,000 decisions uh, in Germany and over I think probably by, by the stage 50 decisions challenges in front of the constitutional court yeah to the point where at the same time they were asked by a 30 year old that the you know that the getting rid of the regulations wasn't going fast enough. And at the same day, a challenge by a 60 year old said, or oh, there was not, and you know, there should have been more 
lockdown regulations. So like basically the opposite at the same time. And I think that is what for me democracy is about, quite frankly. Sorry, and I'm handing over to Joel. Thanks, Peter. I think um, I'm building on the things that um, that um, have been said before. I think um, for me, there are two main lessons. Um, the first one is that there seems to be a need for legal reform in the area of emergency legislation in New Zealand, particularly in respect to um, public health emergencies, but perhaps also emergencies of a different nature, for example, emergencies related to climate um, change. And, and a, an important question here is, should there be a sort of overarching emergency framework that allows the state to protect public safety in different scenarios? Um, or should there be different frameworks for different types of, of emergencies? Another lesson, and this one I think we are still not yet in a position to fully understand, has to do with our conception about what is possible and impossible in a 21st century society. And I mean this both in terms of the risks that, that we may face in the future, but also in the sense that during the crisis, we saw that the state's ability to protect um, what may be described as the public good is perhaps much bigger than we thought. I mean, um, in a way, if you think about it, capitalism was basically suspended for a few weeks. And, and, and as I said earlier, there may be a lesson there about the scope of what is possible in terms of our capacity to deal um, with other important social problems that go beyond, um, beyond the COVID-19 um, emergency. And with this, I think I'll pass it back to um, Jeff for some final um, comments. Right, thanks everybody. I'm gonna use the chair's prerogative to talk about something that nobody's talked about so far is another thing which probably falls in all the categories of striking, surprising, and a lesson for the future is that New Zealand has achieved whatever it's achieved. And I'm a bit worried about some of the triumphal tone that maybe even we're falling into because this is a very, as Ashley Bloomfield has told us many times, a very devious, pernicious virus. But it strikes me that there's another lesson to join about the value of educating people and the value of liberal humanities education for people. The New Zealand has a very strong tradition of universal public education. And that's shared by other countries, but in our country, it was founded by the man whose statue was in front of our government buildings, Peter Fraser, the man who saved us from the depression and saved us from the Second World War, and then tried to save the world in San Francisco. But for me, one of the great lessons of this whole thing is that you need to keep on educating your people to understand complex information and to be able to think critically when they receive that information and to be able to act upon it when they need to. And from our own perspective at the university, where we, we feel the humanities have been constantly under threat for the last 20 or 30 years, we are often even the law faculties of the, of the New Zealand are not well treated, to be honest, by the government. And we are seen as somehow inferior to our science friends, not that they're not important, but I think that really shows the real need to keep on doing what we have always done in New Zealand, which is to try and educate as many people as we possibly can in what you might call the liberal arts or the humanities, so that people, when they need to, can understand information when they need to, as Petra would suggest, question that information. But that's a really important lesson as we go forward. And I just had saw a post by one of our colleagues in the School of Languages who made the very good point that one of the most striking things about the New Zealand response was the fact that when the Prime Minister spoke, we always had a sign language interpreter, which I spoke, think spoke to a New Zealand value that people should be able to understand what their government is telling them. With that, I just want to thank everybody who's spoken today, particularly in no disrespect to Petra and Joel, but to thank Eddie, Dean and Nessa. We've enjoyed putting these things together. I think for us, it's been a focus of our week, trying to make sense of things that were incomprehensible.
Um, we thank everybody who's got so far at the end of our, seven, um, our seventh session. There are some plans in the future to, to morph this into another kind of platform in terms of faculty discussions to be made available to the public, but we're very grateful. We've had some really great responses from people um, who've appreciated what we've tried to do. Um, it's been a really interesting seven or eight weeks, and we all sincerely hope that this really will be the last legal lowdown on the lockdown, and that we see no more lockdowns in our lifetimes anyways. So thanks to everybody who's participated, and thanks particularly to the people who have listened, and thanks lastly to Sherelle who has produced these recordings, who set them up, and to make sure they get promoted. So thanks everybody. We'll see you in another format discussing something else later. Cheers.